Okay, students, more on sexual selection. We've introduced the topic and we're going to talk about intrasexual selection first, then intersexual selection. So let's get to our PowerPoint. And <clears throat> this is not where we want to start, I think. We're here. Um, we've just introduced these two different types of sexual selection and <clears throat> the fact that sexual selection is a form of natural selection, but it sometimes competes with natural selection. Um, moreover, there are different components or types of such sexual selection. There's competition for mates. Uh, this would be considered intra sexual selection, competition within the same species for access to the mates. This tends to be strongest in males. And then there's also intersexual selection, which would be choosiness, a selection for traits that um, selection for traits that enhance one's ability to succeed um, because they are choosy about whom to mate with. All right, so we're going to focus in this video on competition for mates, intrasexual selection, if you will. Okay, and there are different. <clears throat> kinds of competitions that take place. This seems strange, but let's take a look at them. So um, individuals could compete for mating or copulation directly for the act of, of getting to mate or getting to copulate, right? So there are lots of ways to do this. One of them is to achieve a dominant status with fighting or to achieve a dominant status with threats or displays and therefore have access to multiple females or more females than other individuals in the population. This will probably lead to traits that are um, increased weaponry, increased size types of traits. A good example of this would be with the red deers. They've been well studied in the UK. <clears throat> the red deer remind us of our elk, all right? The males form harems during the breeding season and they must fight off other males to defend their harems. The defender of the harem or the holder of the harem has um, essentially full-on mating rights with all of the females in the group. The solitary males have very few opportunities to mate. Okay, so what happens? What do they do? Well, they use what I would call honest indicators of fighting ability. Um, and here's what they typically do. We've got a little diagram. Um, two males will approach each other, a holder and a solitary male, and they'll begin a roaring contest often. One of the stags then would with, could withdraw, or they could start engaging in kind of various threat displays where they do this weird parallel walk. And one, at that point, one might decide, yep, you have, you have it, I'm out of here. Or a fight could in, ensue, right? Um, an actual fight, okay? Other situations, we might not have the roaring contest. Either way, there's kind of a, a sequential set of actions to determine which male is dominant, right? Is the holder dominant? Is the um, unfamiliar male mo moving into the territory dominant? Um, there's this pattern or sequence of events that typically takes place. Now, <clears throat> roaring roaring <laughs> seems to be an honest indicator of fighting ability. Um, and researchers have found, if we look at this graph that says the mean roars per minute versus the, um, uh, you know, different times. The, if you're a holder, you're doing, a, that's when you have a harem. You're doing way more roars than anyone else. And roaring seems to be uh, a way to that these males can assess each other. Um, larger, longer roars are um, uh, roars are more successful at holding their harem, at maintaining their harem, if you will. Okay. Okay. And that's just one example of mate um, mate competition, like competing directly. Other animals in more complex social systems may form alliances that enhance uh, copulatory or mating success. So 
baboons fall into this category. <clears throat> so baboons, um, in, bab uh, in baboon societies, you've got um, males and females living in kind of complex structures, and they each have kind of hierarchies, the males and the females do. Um, some males are more dominant than others. Typically, 8 to 11-year-old males get most of the matings in the entire group. The males of the lower status tend to get matings with less receptive females. So it's a bad situation if you have lower status. One of the things that some males with lower status can do to enhance their ability to mate is form some alliances. Sometimes a baboon male will form a friendship or an alliance with a female who has a baby, who has an infant. Um, maybe this male will babysit, will hang out with a female, will um, groom the female, and eventually this female may seek out the male when she's fertile. So forming a friendship or an alliance is to the male's advantage. Sometimes male subordinates will form alliances with each other. So you've got several male subordinates that attempt to confront a dominant male and remove him from power. If they can remove that dominant male from power, then they'll have access to uh, sexually reproductive females as well. That's just one example. Okay, another thing that you can do is interfere with another male that is attempting to mate with a female. So <clears throat> elephant seals, for example, these are really strange looking seals, aren't they? Uh, males fight for females. So they fight for access. They compete with each other for access to females. A single male will have a harem of females. And what happens is um, sometimes um, another male will try to come in and mate with a member of the harem. A female will make a protest call when that happens. Uh, that triggers the more dominant harem-owning male to um, waddle over or swim over or whatever they do and attempt to actually physically remove that male from mating. Okay, So physically removing another male is a way to deal with it. Oh, this is a gross picture of an earwig. It's like my least favorite animal ever. Um, this is kind of interesting though. Heavier males will try to remove lighter males during copulation. So if a lighter male is mating, the heavier male will try to like boot them out of there. I love that. Okay, what else can happen? Um, males can compete by cuckoldry. Cuckoldry is essentially a situation in which a male is raising young that aren't his own. And it would be um, that would certainly not be adaptive for the male who's, rate, who's been cuckolded, but it would be highly adaptive for males whose young are being raised by someone else, right? So we've got bluegills here as our example. <clears throat> Bluegill sunfish have um, kind of three major morphs in a population. So bluegill males typically build a nest in a territory and then attempt to attract a female to the nest to mate with him. That is, bluegill males that are parental, territory-owning, nest-building males. That's one type or one morph, and it's shown here in letter A, if you will. Okay. These males tend to be big, they own their own territories, and they take care of the eggs and the young for a while afterward. Other males in a bluegill population are called sneaker males. They tend to be smaller, they hide, um, they're not aggressive, they don't have territories. What they'll typically do is they'll hide in whatever place they can hide in until a male and a female nearby are spawning. And then as they're spawning, the sneaker males will sneak in to spawn at the same time, okay? Um, when they sneak in to spawn at the same time, the parental male has been cuckolded some of those eggs that are laid are probably um, fertilized by sneaker males. It's kind of called a hit and run strategy, if you will. And these sneaker males have a very high ratio of testes size to body size. So they produce 
a high density of sperm, they have big testes relative to like our parental males. So they um, have actually physiological adaptations for this behavioral strategy. The third type of male out there are called satellite males. These are ones that mimic a female to sneak a copulation. So these satellite males look much more like females. In bluegill fish, they are uh, more dull. They don't have the bright coloration. And they are the, you know, the same size, smaller than the big parental males. They position themselves, this is kind of part D here, they position themselves between a spawning pair. So you've got the parental male, you've got the female, and here's the, here's the satellite male sneaking in as well. Um, and he mimic, as he mimics the female, he drops sperm, and the parental male then tries to mate, as the parental male tries to mate with him and with the other female. So our satellite male wins some, um, some mating as well, or wins some offspring as well in this sneaky way. Uh, researchers have shown that there seems to be approximately equal reproductive success between these different strategies. Um, but they seem to be a conditional strategy. Uh, what that means is animals will do different things depending on their condition. So an animal in poor condition might become a sneaker or a satellite male. An animal that's in good condition, that's large, would likely become a territory um, parental male. Oh, and here's a, a quick di a digression. This is kind of interesting. So we've got these interesting different mating strategies that we see in a lot of different animals. Are they determined conditionally or are they genetically determined? So some researchers are looking into this at, at, for a different species, and it could be either one. A conditional strategy would be like, hey, you're just making the best of a bad situation. So you're a young frog and you're really little, so you're not going to get you know, you're not going to make big calls and attract females. Instead, what you should do is hang out by a big male who's making great calls. And then maybe, just maybe, you can sneak in and get a mating. All right? It's a conditional strategy. When you get bigger and older, you might become a territory only or a calling male in this case. Or it could be genetically determined. Maybe there are strategies that are selected for that have... Um, uh, that are determined by one's genetics, that are inheritable traits, if you will, right? So in these situations, we would expect strategies to have about the same reproductive success, so each is about selected for equally. This is a great example of uh, a marine isopod. Looks a little bit like a roly-poly. Uh, that has been well studied. These marine isopods live in sponges. And what typically happens, and, and I'll show you this picture here, there's three different strategies that males can take on. The large males on the right over here are called the alpha males. These males live in a sponge. They defend a sponge, and they allow females to live in that sponge with them. And then they get the matings of all the females who live in the sponge. There are beta males, they're kind of medium in size. They look a lot like females. And what they do is they sneak into the sponge and they act like females in the sponge with a larger male. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> when mating is happening, they, uh, they essentially are fooling the male, but when there are females to be had, they'll mate with them. Okay? So they have access to the sponge because they look like a female. And then there's these little guys, the sperm bombs, if you will. They're called the gamma isopods. They avoid, they, they enter the sponges secretly and avoid the alpha male at all costs, right? They sneak into the sponge and then during mating, they simply dive bomb a couple that's mating. So their job is, they, they have a really high, um, uh, a large amount, of, they produce a large amount of sperm relative to their body size, all right? It turns out all three strategies seem to be about equally successful, and there's genetic determination of them. There's a single gene with three alleles that seems to determine whether you will become an alpha, a beta, or a gamma sperm bomb isopod living in these sponges. So it's kind of an interesting um, situation where you've got different strategies. <clears throat> okay, so the animal has already mated. 
but could there be competition between males after a mating? You bet. All right, so sperm competition can happen. That's competition between males after the female has mated with several males. So some sperm might be better able to compete and to fertilize the female eggs. That's what uh, those traits would be selected for in uh, male populations, right? <clears throat> Here's an example. Sperm competition in dung flies. So these ugly, ugly flies that lay their eggs in, in dung, right, have sort of interesting courtship. Um, what typically happens is a male will copulate with a female, and, uh, and then she may copulate with another male, and then she may copulate with another male. Turns out the last male to copulate is most likely to um, father the offspring. Okay, to who is most likely to have sperm, his sperm fertilize the eggs. And also, um, this related to this is the length of copulation, the duration of copulation by the second male, it's by the last male. So if we look at the copulation duration and look at this in minutes, some of these dung animals, dung, dung flies are copulating for minutes. The longer that the, the last male copulates, the higher proportion of the offspring are his. So it pays off to be last, and it pays off to, to copulate for a long time. What's happening here is as, his, as the second male sperm um, arrive, that pushes out or displaces the first male sperm. So the longer you copulate, the more sperm you produce and have, the less likely that other sperm is going to fertilize the eggs. Here's another example. Sperm, comp sperm competition in dunnocks. So some animals will kind of actively peck at or remove the sperm of other males. Okay, let's take a look at this video. That was weird. It's a video of two, uh, two birds, a female and a male, if I can get it going. It doesn't work. Eh, we'll see. <clears throat> it's struggling, people, struggling. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we've got the male on the left. He is pecking at the female's cloaca. This female must have already mated with another male, and he's trying to remove the sperm that's in her cloaca. That's the opening where the sperm are deposited in, um, in birds. He's spending all his time getting rid of the other sperm. At some point, you assume he's going to actually mate. Ah, that's it. <laughs> he never made it in the picture. Too bad. We missed it. Okay. So, um, that's just another example of um, animals that, whose sperm compete. So there are, and there are lots of animals that, kind of, lots of males that scrub or try to remove other male sperm. So black-winged damselflies do this, dunnocks do this, rats remove, um, uh, remove what are called cloacal plugs. After a male copulates, they put in a plug and essentially tries to prevent other males from being successful. <laughs> other males remove that plug. <laughs> it's crazy, crazy business. And then there's mate guarding. Okay, <clears throat> so you've just mated with a female, but she's still fertile guard the female to protect her from mating with other males, thereby protecting your investment, right? Your reproductive success. Lots of animals do this. Idaho ground squirrels, ele elephant seals, as shown in the picture here, you got one male and one female. Damselflies will, will basically guard their female that they just mated with to prevent other males from mating. Good system. Um, just as a side note, what about humans? Do we see mate guarding in humans? Dun, dun, dun. You bet we do. Um, a researcher named David Buss does a lot of research on uh, mating systems and mate selection in, uh, in humans. And they've been doing research for like 20 years on this. And um, they've suggested that, you know, males and females are subject to different selective pressures, just like they are in the animal kingdom. Um, male, a big problem that males have is the risk of being cuckolded. That's spelled incorrectly there. Um, 
the risk of raising another male's young. Females, on the other hand, risk you know, physical damage, they risk losing some resources that can be used in raising the young. Okay, but let's not worry about her. Let's look at the risk of being cuckolded. So you don't want some, you don't want to raise some other male's young, right? What kinds of things can you do? One of them is mate guarding. Here are some um, examples that BUS proceeds as examples of mate guarding in males. Males do this much more than females when do this list of events. Um, so here are some of them. They have greater vigilance. That is, they pay more attention, males do, to other males in the area. They can be violent against a perceived rival. They can conceal a mate. Oh, let's not go to that party. We don't want to show off. They monopolize a mate's time. So we're going to spend all our time together so no other male can be with you or make verbal threats. They, um, here's a couple more, have physical signs of possessions. They do things like holding hands or hugging in public, kissing in public, those kinds of things that identify a male as hate or identify a female as though this is my possession, so to speak. Um, they use possessive lamentation. Hey, give that female, um, you know, a jacket or a ring to show that I, she belongs to me type of thing. Interesting, huh? Buss would say that this is, these are all examples of mate guarding in humans because males need to, males have strong competition against other males. They risk being cuckolded. These traits have been selected for over time in humans, is the idea. <coughs> um, infanticide. Okay, we've been kind of touching on infanticide in a number of different lectures, but here we're talking about infanticide by adult males. So this is a situation in which an adult male uh, kills the young of a female. All right. A nice example of that would be in Langer monkeys. This, this is described in our Mother Nature textbook. Um, what happens in Langer monkeys is these monkeys live in uh, groups with some males and some females, um, mostly related but not all, right? And what happens occasionally is a new male, a stranger, will come into the group, take and take over, and become dominant. And when he does, he hunts down and kills unwanted infants. He hunts down the infants in the troop and kills them. That's called infanticide. Why on earth would a male do this? What advantage does it give him? Does it give him, is this adaptive? You know, is this even adaptive? We think that it possibly is adaptive for the, for the um, stranger male for the male moving into the territory. And it possibly could have evolved as a strategy that some males use to um, enhance their reproductive success, to compete with other males. So when a stranger male moves into a Langer group and kills off infants, those infants are not his. He's never been there before, hasn't mated with any of the females. Um, but what happens when he kills off the females is the, um, I mean, the infants is that the moms whose infants are killed quickly become sexually receptive. So they're nursing, but when ma baby is killed, nursing stops, moms become sexually receptive, and moms typically copulate or solicit matings from the new male. So the new male is going to have faster reproductive success at the expense of the other males whose infants were killed, at the expense of the females whose infants were killed as well. She has to kind of start over, if you will. So it's possible that infanticide is in fact an adaptive strategy that males have evolved to compete with other males, um, a way to increase reproductive success. Uh, a trait that's been selected for by intrasexual selection. Are there other examples of this? Absolutely. Our text is kind of filled with these, and there's even a chapter or two on human infanticide. Um, but here's an example with baboons. In baboons, males kill young that aren't their own as well, and that again speeds up, uh, speeds, uh, 
up the rate at which females become reproductively ready to breed again. But here's the catch. In baboons, researchers have found that females, females are pretty tricky themselves. Females will reduce the risk of infanticide by doing a whole suite of behaviors. One simple behavior is when a new male arrives, a female will avoid that male, okay? Will basically avoid that alpha male um, all the time. Okay. Another situation, she may make friendships with males in the group and these males might help her defend, uh, defend against the infanticidal male, defend her young. So making specific coalitions or alliances is good for her. She may mate with many other males. What that does is it confuses paternity. If a female mates with multiple males, male might be like, hmm, that young could be mine, but it could be, you know, Joe's. Which one is it? Yeah, I don't know. I better not kill it. All right. So there are a number of strategies that female baboons use to uh, reduce in, the effects of infanticide, reduce infanticide, um, because that's certainly, infanticide certainly is not adaptive for females. So there uh, we've got males and females pitted against each other in terms of their strategies. And humans and infanticide, uh, does that ever happen? Uh, we'll talk about infanticide in humans uh, in a couple, of, a couple um, of videos from now. Okay, and then there's a digression, but we're basically done with intrasexual selection. Now what's interesting is Back in the mid-1800s to the 1900s, very few biologists considered the variation in reproductive success of females to be meaningful at all. In fact, most biologists assumed that every single female mates, every single female becomes a mother and has equal success at being a mother. On the other hand, only the best, most competitive, largest males become fathers, right? In other words, there's variation in, ma in the males, in, in their behaviors. Some males do better than others. So some males will be selected for, some male traits will be selected for bigger weaponry, strength, whatever it is, right? And that can lead to evolution in males. Those weird question marks are supposed to be arrows, I think. So, you know, studying male traits, male behaviors and male traits are, are really interesting because there's variation in male traits and, um, and that can lead to um, selection acting, which leads to evolution. Males are cool. Females, on the other hand, are kind of boring. They've been um, marginalized, really, yeah, over the last couple of hundred years because People didn't think, researchers didn't think that females varied a lot in their reproductive success. They sort of thought every female had kind of similar reproductive success. Why well, study them? There can't be much evolution going on in the females. Well, researchers like Jane Altman said, wait a minute now. There is variation in the reproductive success of females. There can be evolution of important traits in females as well. She um, noticed things like <clears throat> reproductive success variation in reproductive success for um, for high-ranking versus low-ranking baboons. So high-ranking baboons have a higher rate of success at, re at reproducing, at producing living offspring. Low-ranking baboons, um, not so much. And in fact, they vary in their um, probability of producing sons and daughters. So high-ranking baboons tend to produce more females who are part of the baboon dynasty, if you will, this female um, lineage, and are probably likely to, to gain access to that female dynasty and be, and be dominant in their world. Low-ranking baboons, when they have daughters, those daughters are likely to be harassed, less likely to be survived. And so what we see with the low-ranking baboons is they're more likely to give birth to sons. So here we've got um, variations in reproductive success leading to very different strategies by different baboon females, depending on their social place, if you will, or their status in the group. There can be other variations, such as the age at first birth or the duration between births. 
that vary between females and can be selected for or against. A chimp named Flo uh, has been had been studied by Jane Goodall, and she had apparently an amazing dynasty that she raised. She gave birth to lots and lots of offspring who were all successful and did well in their in their group. And she's very different than some of the other chimps in that same group. Um, so what is it? What is it? She's she, traits that she have have been selected for, right? In any case, there's lots of variation out there in females. So female, um, looking at females and thinking about how they have evolved is important too. And people like Jane Altman, yay, Jane Altman. We, we love that, that she said, hey, let's focus on females too. So we'll do that in the next video. Thanks. Let me get this off.